5. Nehemiah chapter 5. <coughs> this one you need to leave on. Nehemiah chapter 5. Is that on? All right. Um, I, had, I had a title for my message of attack from within. Uh, but then after I did that, when Jenny asked me about the title, I told her that um, I thought a better title would be Keep the Enemy Outside. Keep the Enemy Outside. You'll see what that's all about as we get into this. But Nehemiah chapter 5 and verses 1 through 13, I'm going to read those this morning. And then uh, we'll open in prayer and begin. All right. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We are sons and daughters. Sorry, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and lo, we bring in unto to bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants and some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards and I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words then I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them ye exact usury every one of of his brother and set a great assembly against them and I said unto them we after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews which are sold unto the heathen and will ye even sell your brethren or shall ye be sold unto us then held they their peace and found nothing to answer also I said it is not good that ye do ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen our enemies I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn I pray you let us leave off this usury restore I I pray you to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of, their mo of the money and of the corn, the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests, and took an oath of them, that they should do according to this promise. Also I shook my lap, and said, So God shake out every man from his house, and from his labor, that performeth not this promise, even thus be he shaken out, and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Lord, and the people did according to this promise. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning. Lord, I ask that you would give us wisdom. Pray that you'd give me wisdom and direction. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us understanding of your word and of what's being uh, presented here. Lord, I pray that you'd challenge us uh, even this morning that we might um, recognize the danger of letting this conflict come within the walls and and how Satan can use that to destroy us and to destroy a people and a church and a family and and all kinds of things Lord and I pray that even today we might see that we need to keep the enemy outside the camp outside the walls and Lord I pray that uh, your your hand will be upon us be upon me give me the words to say even this morning Lord I ask in Jesus name amen Amen. All right. The most lethal attack is the attack from within. Here in, here in Nehemiah chapter 5, I believe that we have somewhat of a, of, of, of a parenthetical situation. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, what I mean is that some of the, event, the events that uh, do not follow, uh, some of the events in this book don't follow an exact timeline. 
Okay, uh, I believe that this of uh, that this situation that we're talking about here is somewhere uh, outside of, of of the time of the building of the wall. We saw in chapter four how the enemy was attacking and that they were that they were making preparations of how to continue to build the walls and how to do, to repel the attack of the enemy from outside and 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 continue to work and to continue to build and and all of those things. And then over in chapter six. When we get down to ch chapter 15 or to verse 15, we see there that the Bible says, So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month, Elal, in 50 and two days. Okay? Um, and so. In chapter 5, we have this story, and even down in, uh, what is it, down in verse 14, I think. Um, it says here, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the two and 30th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. So <clears throat> we have a little bit of a, maybe a seeming uh, discrepancy here in, in the timeline. All right. And as I studied this and as I looked at it, and as I thought about it, uh, the observation that I made is that different cultures at different times do not strictly follow a linear way of thinking. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Maybe, you know, people that are like that, they'll be telling you a story and, and, and pretty soon they're talking about yesterday and you don't know how they ended up talking about yesterday. We were talking about tomorrow, 13 seconds ago. Right. And uh, you say, what in, what in the world is going on? But it, it seems like in other cultures, this is this is uh, is prevalent. And when we were in Bolivia, uh, I would when I would listen to a native pastor or native preacher, it seemed like that they had the tendency to talk about something from yesterday and then talk about something for tomorrow. And I was just scrambling to try to keep up on what exactly was going on and, 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 and everything. And I, I got to thinking about it, you know, it's kind of like working on the wiring in an old house. Has anybody ever done that? Have you ever worked on the wiring in an old house and you're in the bathroom and you're trying to figure out which breaker shuts off the bathroom and you go through them all and you find out, okay, this, this one shuts off the bathroom, but it doesn't just shut off the bathroom. It also shuts Shuts off the sump pump in the barn. You think, well, how in the world are those two connected? Well, it, it just seems like what, there was a wire there and they cut into it and they run wire over or electricity over there. And sometimes that's kind of the way of the thinking of. And, and if you grow up in that culture, if you grow up and you and, and, and that's what you're accustomed to, it, it just seems fine. Right. And, and, and I don't know if it if it strictly follows you know, regions or whatever. But um, I think that uh, as far as English speaking people, we have a tendency to think very linear. This happened and this happened and this happened. We keep it all neat and organized and everything. And then some people, they just kind of throw it in a bucket, shake it around. And however it comes out, it comes out. Right. Now, <clears throat> what is the point of all this? I think that Nehemiah was telling a story years after all of this happened. And he's writing this down and he inserts this story kind of as a parenthesis. Okay. And he tells a story about this conflict that he had uh, with the people, uh, with the Jews that were inside the city at that time. We see a lot of this if you study through prophetical books, when you study through the book of, of um, Revelation. You'll see that that the timeline isn't necessarily uh, intact. How about that? <laughs> right. It kind of jumps around a little bit. OK. And so anyways, um, <clears throat> this is I think is a little bit out of order, if you will. OK. And, and, and I guess I'll, I'll get into that. Why that matters. OK. Um, later on, when we get down into the message. OK. So, Mainly it is, is so that we remember that when we read the Bible, I believe that it's a mistake to try to force this way of thinking uh, onto the text, this linear way of thinking. As I was studying for this and reading some different commentaries, there was kind of this argument about when did this story take place? When was this conflict over the food? When was this conflict over um, selling their sons and daughters into slavery and, and all of this kind of thing? And, 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 that, and I don't really think that we have to demand that of the scriptures. 
right? I believe it happened, all right? And I don't know exactly when it happened. My personal belief is, is that it happened after the wall was built. I really have a hard time thinking that in the 52 days that it took from the time that Nehemiah came and started the work and it, within 52 days already they were so desperate for food that they started mortgaging their lands and selling their children and doing all of this stuff all within the space of less than two months. Okay, and so I think that this happens sometime later, and 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 we get that that uh, that conflict that's going on. And the reason I think that, I, that that this is important to me is that I think that what happened here is that they suffered this attack from outside this opposition that was that was was trying to slow them down was trying to stop them from building the wall that was trying to hinder the work that God was doing and 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 they were super focused on that and the enemy that was there but then when the wall was finished and they got back to normal life and they started to to, to go about their normal business and then pretty soon all of these things started to happen and pretty soon they started to to, to, to bicker and to fight and to have hardships and the things of the of life started to get um, more and more and more desperate and then these things came in and so that is where the uh, the emphasis of this message is is that that when the when the emphasis on the the enemy without when it's when it calms down we have to worry about the enemy attacking within and the enemy attacking within is going to sow all kinds of discord and do all kinds of things and and trying to, to and try to just to mess us up. OK, um, I think that what is happening is that Nehemiah. OK, I, I already said that all of this is under the inspiration of the word of God. And this is the story that God wants us to, to understand. But uh, it's it, 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 it's um, not necessarily all in, in linear time. All right, so with this in mind, I want to dive into the text at hand. Nehemiah is presented here with an internal struggle. All right. Uh, that internal struggle was the dearth. That internal struggle was the famine. But it wasn't just the famine. All right. It was how they handled the famine. If they had if they had hit that head on the way they addressed the enemy that was without the enemy that was trying to stop them from building the wall, if they would have addressed it that way, then I think that they would have pulled this. They would have pulled them together and they would have pulled through. And, and, and really, every challenge in our lives has one of two ways it can go. Okay, it can either pull people together as they rally and try to and try to, to face the challenge that's that's there, or they can start blaming everybody else. And I can start blaming my neighbor and my my my, my uh, banker and, and, and whoever the case may be. OK, and we have to be careful that we don't allow this this struggle, that we don't allow Satan to get within the wall and start to divide uh, to divide and to conquer. So Nehemiah is presented with this struggle. He's presented with this with this problem that we see here as uh, chapter five starts out. It says, and there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. So we see that this is all started to build up and it's all started to 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 come to Nehemiah's attention. So we see Nehemiah's realization. The problem is explained. All right. What is that problem? The problem was a food shortage. Not now it had gotten bad uh, and it was and, and, and so when I, I, I said earlier, this either was in existence before Nehemiah got there or it happened at some other time, because within 52 days, it seems hard for me to believe that it got so serious. OK, but it was serious. All right. They were mortgaging their fields and they were mortgaging their vineyards. I think that some of them had to sell land and sell homes and sell possessions and all of these things in order to buy food. This was a serious problem. And as many problems that enter into our lives, I don't want to make light of the problem. OK, what I want to focus on is how they address the problem and, and what they did about it. OK, uh, this was a serious 
problem. A famine is a, is a big deal, right? It's a big problem, and we have to, we have to take this serious, all right? Um, and so the famine was in the land, and they were trying to deal with it, and they were trying to do whatever they could to, 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 to buy food and, and, and to provide for their families, all right? They were borrowing from their countrymen, borrowing money to pay, uh, and, and even to, to pay taxes, that, that comes up as well. There was a famine, and they were selling everything, and then they had to buy, they had to pay taxes, and they had to do all of this, and so the, 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 the pressure was extreme, all right? Not only were they having to borrow money, but some of their countrymen were charging them high interest, okay? Uh, they were charging usury, and this okay, was forbidden by the law. The law forbade that they would charge usury. In Leviticus 25, 36, it said that you wouldn't, they weren't to charge usury to their, to their countrymen, all right? Not only were they borrowing money, not only were they paying high interest, then they were selling their children to pay their debts. I cannot begin to understand how desperate you would have to be to sell your children into slavery to, to pay your bills. Now, I can understand wanting to give them away sometimes, right? Sometimes I can understand just say, hey, just take them, right? Just take them. No strings attached. You don't owe me anything, right? I can understand that. But to be so desperate that you had to sell them into slavery, this was a bad situation, all right? I, I, I want us to recognize that. This was a horrible situation. And Nehemiah is hearing about these, and he's hearing about these problems. They're all brought to his, to his attention, and then he's expected to do so. Well, what was Nehemiah's response? What did he do? Well, his response was anger. But his response was anger under control. Okay, Nehemiah was angry. He heard the situation, and it caused great anger. All right? Now... Sometimes people say, well, we shouldn't ever get mad. We shouldn't be angry. We shouldn't get mad and all this, th this kind of thing. However, I think that sometimes the problem is, all right, that for some people, there's never anything that makes them mad. All right? And I think that it was okay for Nehemiah to get mad. I think, in fact, there ought to be some things in this life that make us mad. There ought to be some things that we feel so strongly about that, that we're willing to stand up and take a stand against them, stand up and fight about it, stand up and, 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 and take it you know, head on, all right? So, for that reason, I don't think that there's any problem with Nehemiah's response, all right? Let me look down here. Um... Verse 6, and I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Nehemiah says, this made me mad. I don't, I don't understand what was going on, but, but it made me mad. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 says, be ye angry and sin not. It doesn't tell us to never be angry. All right. And so I don't see anything wrong with Nehemiah's response. What are some things that ought to make us angry? Well, there's probably a lot of things that, that we could put on this list, but I think that we ought to be angry about sin. I think that we ought to be angry about sin in our own lives. I think we ought to be angry about sin in our culture. I think we ought to be angry about, about sin in, 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 in our world, right? The Bible tells us that sin brings death, all right? We ought to be angry about sin. We ought to want to do something about it. We ought to condemn it anywhere it's found. And, and, and it ought to start right here. We ought to be concerned about our own sin. And we ought to be angry about it. We ought to want to stop it. All right? We also ought to be angry about injustice. There's all kinds of injustice in the world, all kinds of things that are going on that, 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 that just aren't right. And this is, I think, what... Nehemiah was most angry about here all kinds of injustice hearing that people were selling their lands and hearing that people were borrowing money and not just that they were borrowing money but they were borrowing money from their neighbors and their friends and their countrymen and their countrymen were taking advantage of them they were charging them high interest and they were they were taking away their stuff and they were demanding their children to be given to them as payment and and and, and this just made Nehemiah angry. We should be angry at injustice. We should be angry when people are taken advantage of. 
All of these things ought to cause us to be angry, all right? But I don't think that we should act in that anger, right? And Nehemiah didn't do that. Nehemiah did not act in his angry, in, in his anger. He got angry and that caused him to respond. Well, what was his response? Well, his response is found there in verse seven. It says, then I consulted with myself. Okay, then I consulted with myself. What does that mean? It just means that Nehemiah stopped and he thought about it. Right? This is maybe the second most important thing that we ought to do, right? Is think before we act. All right? I think it's fine to get angry. I think it's fine to have that response. I think it's fine to feel, to feel deeply about some of these things. But before we fly off the handle and jump into action, we ought to stop for a few minutes and just think about it and say, what should I do? What should I do? All right? Um, I, for one fail to do this sometimes all right now i think that according to nehemiah's past he probably stopped and prayed as well we can look back for at, at, at chapter one and the beginning part of chapter one when nehemiah heard about the condition of the walls in israel and condition of the city and condition of all that was going on in jerusalem he stopped and he prayed about it he prayed to his god earlier we saw and, and as we were reading through here many times nehemiah stopped and he prayed and he got a plan, okay? And the Bible says here that he stopped and consulted with himself. I think that he, he thought it over. What should I do? I believe he probably took it to prayer as well, just based on who he was and, and, and what he's done in other places. And then he made a plan, all right? I think that Nehemiah was a, pl a planner. He prayed and he planned and then he pursued, he proceeded with, with that plan. Okay, so what is Nehemiah's relevance to us? As we look at this story and we see uh, what's going on here, we see that there's a famine in the land. We see that there's, there's efforts to, to, to uh, buy food and to pay taxes and all of these things. We see that the people are, are, are suffering this hardship. Okay, but um, as, as I read through this chapter, it was really hard for me to relate that to what we might experience today. What do I have in my life? Now, obviously, um, you know, sometimes it's a struggle to put food on the table and sometimes it's a struggle to pay our taxes and all that. But we live in a, in a country that has abundant food. We live in a country that has, uh, you know, provisions and safety and, and programs. So if you can't buy food, there's programs for that. And there's protections for people who fall on hard times. And if I borrow money and I can't pay it back, then there's a way for me to, to get out from under that without having to sell my children and 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 to go to those to those extremes however nehemiah's story does highlight the reality that when people fall into hard times when people when people when the enemy is no longer without that sometimes that that enemy moves inside and starts to cause trouble there is an internal conflict here and this was the real issue. The real issue here in Nehemiah chapter 5 is, is that, that when, when, when the enemy outside of the camp, when the enemy outside of the walls had kind of had kind of gone away and stopped bothering them, when the, when the walls were erected and they were safe from everything outside, that then they started to turn on each other inside. And it was a legitimate problem. I'm not saying it wasn't legitimate, but the way they handled it wasn't the way they should have handled it. And Nehemiah was asked to come to the, to the rescue. That is the issue. How do we handle that? How do we handle when those, when those issues come in and, 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 and what are we supposed to do? There was fighting within the ranks of Israel because of the hardship and the injustice committed by those who had money and food. And they were Israelites. They were Jews. Okay, and, 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 and so it was Jew against Jew, Israelite against Israelite, and there was that, there was that conflict and there was that fight. It was kind of like a, a, a family feud, if you will, right? The conflict came inside, right? Our real enemy is outside. Keep him there, 
right? First Peter chapter five and verse eight, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he, whom he may devour. The enemy is outside. Keep him there. Don't let him get inside. Don't let him come inside the walls. Don't let him start to, to, to cause strife and, 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 and fighting and, and all of this stuff inside. Our greatest threat is outside. Don't let him come inside. Don't let him come inside the church. The church will thrive as long as we recognize this principle. Satan is our enemy. And as long as we keep the attack, as long as we keep pushing forward, and as long as we keep, as we keep uh, pounding on the, the gates of hell, Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As long as we keep pounding on those gates and pushing forward and, and, and keeping our mind on that and recognizing that the, that the enemy is outside, we can keep him from the inside. I was thinking about it <clears throat> during Sunday school and, and, and in between church today. Uh, there are churches all over this country. There are churches all over the world that are closing down, that are, that are, that are just uh, drying up and shutting down and going away. But I wonder how many of those, it's because there was internal conflict. How many are, are closing down? How many are going away because there's, there's some internal strife? Because Satan has got inside the wall somehow and he's caused this, this turmoil and this arguing and this bickering and, 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 and those things to happen. And pretty soon people go away because of, of, of the fighting and all that's going on. And then I wonder how many churches that are active in what a church ought to be doing are really shutting down how many churches that are out there and that are that are trying to win souls how many churches that are out there that are that are trying to send missionaries how many churches that are out there that are separate from worldly influence and are striving to be holy how many churches out there that are actually preaching the word and standing on the word of god how many of them are actually closing down I think that the, 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 the percentage would be way higher in those where that uh, they kind of turn their attention inside and they start fighting, they start arguing, and they start worrying about all the little things that, that churches start to worry about. They took their attention off of what their attention was supposed to be. It is when we stop doing these things, we start to turn on each other. We start worrying what everybody else is doing or not doing. We start worrying about who is getting the credit or who's being noticed. We start to be critical of everything. We start to be critical of the music and the preaching and the programs or the lack thereof. Too many potlucks, not enough potlucks. You get the picture, right? We start to worry about all those kinds of things. And pretty soon somebody gets offended and they go down the street and somebody else gets offended and they go, and, 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 and we're all in, in, in this infighting, right? Instead of keeping our eye on Jesus, instead of keeping our eye on the Great Commission, instead of keeping our eye on what our eye is supposed to be on. Recognize when Peter got out of the boat, right? He was doing just fine as long as his eyes were on Jesus and he was walking forward. But when he started looking around at all the circumstances and everything that was happening and all of this, that's when he began to sink. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the enemy. Keep the enemy outside the camp. That's where he ought to be. The enemy should not be in. Don't let the enemy inside the camp. All right? We start to focus on the internal things. Now, recognize starving people is bad. Absolutely. Right? Do some of these internal things matter? Well, sure they do. Some of the things that happen in here that, 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 that we start to fight about, yeah, they do matter. And there's a way to take care of them. Right? But don't let Satan get his toe in the door. And don't let Satan get into those internal conflicts. We need to handle those things the way they ought to be handled and keep our eye outside where it needs to be. Right? They are important. They do matter. But they ought not become the focus. They need to be addressed, corrected, and keep marching forward. Right? The color of the pews is important. The color of the carpet is important. The color we paint the walls is important. Whether we have potlucks or don't have potlucks. The annual meeting, that's, that's important. We need to know how to run things. We need to know where we're going to spend money. We need to know all these things. But that shouldn't become the focus of what we're doing. 
the focus needs to be on what the focus is supposed to be. And that's the Great Commission. That's reaching people for Christ. That's taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. And as long as we're in that fight, we're going to be okay. Recognize, as long as Israel was in that, in that building mode, as long as they could see the enemy out there and they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, and as long as they were building and watching and, 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 and they were involved in that, and that was, those were the things that they were supposed to be doing, as long as they were doing that, they were okay. But when it got quiet, when they were at some sort of peace, then they started bickering about other things. Right? Now, I don't, I don't blame those who needed food. But those who had food, right? If you're in a battle and you're, and, you're, and you're marching against the enemy and somebody's got a snicker bar in their pocket and they say, hey, I'm kind of hungry. You reach in your pocket and you give them the snicker bar, right? But in this situation, somebody had food and they saw a way to make some money on it, right? And, 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 and I, I'll sell you some food. Yeah, it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you interest. And it's going to, okay. They'd taken their, their eye off the enemy and made each other the enemy. The same thing can happen not only in a church. It can happen in your family, right? It can happen in a relationship. It can happen in any organization. When we take our eye off the ball, we start, we start to falter. Just as Peter, I, you notice, um, what was it, on Monday Night Football, when that, uh, that player, uh, what was his, uh, something Hamlin, Dame, Dar Damien, Darren, something. Anyways, um, he had, he suffered that, that cardiac arrest. Everybody all of a sudden just dropped what was going on. They dropped that conflict and they were focused on what he was doing. And all of a sudden, all of the NFL was focused on this. And, 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 and they kind of, there was, there was solidarity in, in, in everything that they were doing. Right. And, and, and that's that's what that that outside conflict brings. It brings focus. And we need to focus on that and focus on what God has called us to do and not focus on some of these trivial little things that that we can get that we can get focused on. Keep the enemy outside. The Bible says there in verse nine. Also, I said, it is not good that ye that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? Shouldn't, be, shouldn't we be walking in the fear of the Lord? Shouldn't be, we be worried about the enemy that is outside? Shouldn't we, we, be, we be pushing forward and, and focusing on that and not, not turning on each other and bickering and thinking that we're going to make money off of, off of each other and, and charging usury to, to everybody? That's what Nehemiah is saying. The enemy is outside, folks. Keep them outside. Keep, keep the focus where it needs to be. You see, when Christianity started, there was opposition all around. In fact, one of the first per persecutors was a man named Saul. He sought to drag believers out and jail them or beat them to get them to turn their back or to turn them back to Judaism. However, Saul was converted. He became the Apostle Paul. It was during that first century that the church, Christianity, grew by leaps and bounds. And when Saul and, uh, Paul and Silas arrived in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, it was claimed that they had turned the world upside down. How did they, what, what turned the world upside down? The gospel of Jesus Christ and these, these apostles taking the gospel to every corner of the, of, the, of the known world. And it was in that time where there was severe persecution against the church. But it grew. Christianity grew by leaps and bounds. Right? When we read for the read of the history of Christianity, we find different times of persecution. And again, the faith flourished. Right. However, this is when in our day and time right now here in the United States over the last 200 years, let's say we have not suffered that kind of persecution. And we see the the the. 
we see Christianity falter. We see churches turn on themselves. We see churches dying on the vine. And we see all of this happening under relative peace. Okay? I don't think this is necessarily a, a Christian problem, though. All right? Uh, it's not necessarily a Christian thing. I believe that anything that, that, uh, that uh, when there's a common enemy, when there's a common goal, it, it pulls people together. Look at what happened uh, during, uh, or af right after 9-11, how we all banded together as a, as a nation in solidarity, and we prayed, and we, and we kind of rallied around that whole deal, and it, and it brought us together. Think of World War II. We pulled together as a nation for the cause and built a war machine that brought the Axis powers to their knees. It was interesting when I was back in Michigan this last time, uh, we were going through some stuff and in uh, stuff of my dad's and everything. We found this little uh, this little wallet. Inside that wallet was my great grandpa's gasoline. Uh, quota cards, whatever they, I don't remember what they would have called them, but he turned those cards in that, you know, so that it would allow you to even buy gasoline. You could only buy so much gas and, and everything. And, and, and everybody was fine with it, right? We banded together. It brought us together. There was a common goal and there was a common purpose and, and we all banded together and, 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 and uh, against that common en enemy. But when the fighting calms, we tend to start looking around at other issues. And there were real issues. Hunger, starvation, slavery, those things, right? Um, and sometimes we have real problems in our life. Sometimes some of the things that cause fighting in a church or in a family or an organization, sometimes they're, they're real issues. But they need to be handled in the right way. They need to be handled without allowing Satan to get his foot in the door. They need, to be, they need to be handled so that we can keep our, keep our focus on what our focus needs to be on. The local church needs to be about the Great Commission. Not about the color of the carpet and, the, and, 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 and some of the trivial things that we, that we worry about sometimes. Right? Don't let Satan get his foot in the door. Don't let Satan get inside the walls. Don't let Satan uh, come in and start to, to divide and to conquer. Keep our focus on what's outside. Nehemiah gives us a great pattern uh, in this passage of how we ought to deal with these things. First of all, it's okay maybe to get angry about them, but then sit down, think about it, come up with a plan and proceed with that plan. Come up with a solution to whatever comes so that we can continue to march forward, so that we can continue to build the wall, so that we can continue to carry the Great Commission to the uttermost parts of the earth, so that we can take the Great Commission, we can take the gospel to, to Crow Agency and to, to Ranchester and Dayton and to, to wherever that might be. That is where our attention needs to be. And it just seems like when we, when we back off in that regard, then we start to worry about some of the other things that are going on here. These problems were brought to the atten attention of Nehemiah, and he addressed those problems. But Satan is really good at exploiting some of these, even if they're legitimate issues, and causing great division. Don't allow him to do. I think that this is a good, not only a good warning for us today, but it's also a good gauge as far as where we are and where our attention is. When we start to worry about some of this stuff and we start to, 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 to uh, argue and, 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 uh, and allow uh, conflict and, and all of that in the church, we, we realize at that point that maybe our focus is not where it's supposed to be. Maybe we need to give more to missions. Maybe we need to get out there and hand out some tracts and invite people to church. And maybe we ought to tell some folks about Jesus and how they can know for sure that their sins are forgiven and that they have a home in heaven. Maybe we need to take the gospel to them. And when our, when our focus is where it ought to be, that internal fight, that internal strife just naturally goes away because it fades in importance. It doesn't really matter. If we had pink carpet, it would be fine, right? Uh, it'd be harder to match the, the seats maybe, but uh, it, would be, it would be fine, right? Don't let Satan get inside. Keep the enemy outside. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that you would just, just help us, Lord. Lord, <clears throat> I hope that nobody misunderstands this morning to think that there's some great conflict brewing in the church. There's not that I know of. All I know is that Nehemiah chapter 5 follows Nehemiah chapter 4, and that's where we are today. But Lord, I think it's a great warning for us, whether it be in the church, whether it be in our families, whether it be in our businesses or, or whatever the case may be, that, that we need to keep our focus on the enemy and keep the enemy outside. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us with that. Lord, I don't know. Maybe there's somebody today here who's struggling with some of these issues. Maybe there's some strife in a family. Maybe there's some strife in, in, at, at the workplace. Maybe there's some strife even in this church that I'm unaware of. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to uh, meet those challenges to solve those problems and keep our focus where it ought to be. Lord, I pray that you would just work in our lives and work in our midst. And Lord, I pray that you'd be honored and glorified even in this message, that you would be lifted up. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to recognize that, that you will give us the power to defeat the enemies that we have. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would just help us in that. Lord, I pray that you'd give us the power that we need to, to face the challenges and to, and to do the job that you've given us. Lord, help us to keep our eye on <clears throat> that purpose. I thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you would, please go ahead and stand.